Professor Ludwig, first let me uh, tell you how honored I am that you have agreed to be interviewed in this series. One of the reasons I'm particularly honored is because one of the sponsors of this interview series is now the, the, the China Christianity Studies Group, which was before the China Missions Group, which was really founded by you. So in a way, uh, you are one of the most important people we're interviewing because you are part of the legacy of, of our field and, and the founder of one of our sort of collaborators. But I wanna say a, a, something very briefly about your work. Um, and really there's too much to describe, but I think probably uh, among, among scholars, your most famous work, Professor Lodwick, is certainly your indexing of the Chinese recorder, which is monumental. And uh, what a project, published in the 1980s, uh, con completed at a time when, when certainly there were computers, but not like there are today. So just a huge project. And then, of course, you've written several books. I'm thinking of Crusaders Against Opium. I'm thinking of The Widow's Quest, Educating the Women of Hainan. And of course, your recent book, which is, is a book that I think I will be assigning in my class, that is how Christianity came to China. Um, but the point really is for us to ask you questions. Um, so let's just go to the first question. And that is, Professor Lodwick, uh, if, could you tell us what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And really, if you could add to that, why were you interested in the specific topics about which you researched? Well, I'm one of those people who swore I would never do missionaries. So I always tell students, uh, don't ever say you'll never do something because you'll wind up spending the rest of your life working in that field. But um, I didn't want to do missionaries. So I was looking for a dissertation topic and I think one of my advisors suggested the opium problem. Well. I knew that was too big a problem, too big a problem to cover in one dissertation, and there was no way on earth I was going to spend the next 20 years trying to figure that one out. So I thought, well, I'd look at the end of it and how it was finally legally ended. And I found out that dovetailed into the Pure Food and Drug Acts and the international control of dangerous drugs. All of that came from the missionaries' desire to put themselves on the side of the anti-opium people. So while I was dissertating, I would look through the Chinese recorder, and I came across, uh, in, within one year's time, through the Chinese recorder, the missionaries organized an anti-opium league, wrote a short constitution for the group, what their aims were, elected officers, scheduled, then postponed, rescheduled and held a national meeting in China on this topic. And this happens all in one year in the Chinese recorder. And I said to myself, my gosh, uh, this was important. And uh, of course, I knew about Rawlinson before I got started, but I thought, well, maybe there's something here. And you know, the, the innocence of youth, I went around asking people how long it would take to do an index to this periodical. And the best anybody could come up with, this was a professor of library science, suggested I could hire retired people and it would take six months. 37 undergraduates and nine years later, it was published. And most of the uh, work on the people and the topics, uh, I'm sorry, the places they were, was done by the students. I did the entire subject index myself because, you know, people think differently. And if I let a whole bunch of people do it, we'd have different categories. 
So uh, I did that part of it. And, oh, it was a nightmare. One day, one of my undergraduates said, oh, I wish these people would give us a party. And I said, oh, they're all dead. Within the hour, I was in Springfield, Missouri. Within the hour, one of the people from the Chinese recorder knocked on my office door. And she was quite elderly. And I said, when were you born? And she told me, and I was working one month before her birth would have been announced. So I turned the microfilm down to the next month and I said, there's your birth certificate. That's a legal document. And she was just, and of course, all the students were guffawing because I had just said they were all dead. Uh, and the other thing that really became uh, kind of funny, this was about the time John Hersey's book, The Call, came out. And I finally, I told uh, uh, John Rawlinson that I had to stop reading it because it was confusing me. I said, the three of us, Hersey, Rawlinson, and I are the only three people who probably read the Chinese recorder every single page through. But Hersey was obviously writing a novel, so he didn't stick to the truth. But then I would forget what I'd read in his book and what I'd read in the Chinese recorder. So I gave it up for a while. And when I got done with the book, I called John Rawlinson and I said, I caught him in a mistake. And he said, what? I said, I got Hersey in a mistake. He said, well, what is it? And I said, he referred to Baptists in Hainan and there were only Presbyterians there. <laughs> we had a good laugh about that. So um, I asked John Fairbank, whom I knew, because he had been in the OSS with John Cady, the historian of Burma, who was missionary to Burma in 1935. They had worked together in the OSS, so they were old friends. And he had introduced me to Fairbank. And so I wrote to Fairbank and I asked him um, what he thought if I did an index to the Chinese recorder. And he wrote back and said, that would be wonderful. I'll write a letter of support for you. Uh, yeah, uh, this means the NEH is going to give you money, right? <laughs> so he did, or they did, he did and they did. And I had to ask for two supplements. And at one time he described, and it's in the, the introduction that I wrote, that the project was both a dream and a nightmare. Because, you know, this was printed in English in Shanghai, but the typesetters were Chinese. And they had some trouble. Like there was a missionary whose name was I Stone, E Y E S T O N E. But very frequently he came up as Eve Stone, E V E S T O N E. Well, you know, you had, you couldn't do that on a computer in the 1980s because obviously this is one person if he belongs to the same mission and he's in the same location. And there were, oh, at one time, uh, when we were trying to figure out all the people without first names, trying to pair them up based upon what mission they belonged to and where they were living in China, I said I thought half of Scotland had gone to China, <laughs> which it did seem like that sometimes. But we wound up with a lot of question marks where we didn't know who they're referring to, but it's uh, Reverend Brown did such and such. Well, oh, okay, but we don't know which Reverend Brown it was. But there you are, and uh, you can figure it out if, 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 if <laughs> you got a better crystal ball than I had. Uh, the other thing you should know about the Chinese recorder is we couldn't put everybody in the published book. And so we drew an arbitrary line you have to have three references or more in the Chinese recorder 
to be included. And there were a few exceptions. Joanne Lai was one exception. So I think he has two references, but he's in there with two. Well, when I got done with this, I still had nine boxes of papers of people who had been in the Chinese recorder. And uh, I was talking to, um, uh, hang on, I'm having a moment when I can't remember what I want to say. Uh, I guess it was Martha Smalley. And she said uh, she'd take the leftovers. Mm. Uh, it was Jonathan Spence. That's the name I can't, couldn't think of. Spence said, well, what are you going to do with all that stuff? And I said, uh, give it to any archive that wants it. And he said, give it to Martha. <laughs> so I, I don't remember where I was going at the time. It must have been to an Asian studies meeting because... I have vivid memory of driving my car up to the back door of, of the church archives at Yale and knocking on the door and unloading nine boxes of stuff. Martha didn't happen to be there that day. And when I first mentioned it to her, she kind of gulped and she said, is it in alphabetical order? And I said, yeah, about 99% of it is. There are a few papers lying on the top. So that's where the rest of it is, if anybody wants to look at it at any time. And of course, when they took it, I, I thought they would put it under Chinese recorder. Uh, it turned up under my name, to which I said, oh, I'm much too young to have anything in an archives. <laughs> but if you're, looking, if you're looking for it, it's under my name at the Yale Divinity School archives. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. It sounds like you know the, the the people who were interested in this project include eminent people: John Fairbank, Jonathan Spence, of course, Martha Smalley at Yale, who's you know they're yeah. all retired or gone. Be, uh, gone oh. Gone, but I I started to say John Fairbank was the one who described it. That project is a dream and a nightmare. Oh. But if she can get it done, it, it will be fantastic or something like that yeah. and I spent the year that I had the big grant at the Fairbank Center mm. and Fairbank looked over the subject listings for me and added things that I didn't know about but I certainly knew about by the time I got done mm -hmm. uh, one day he sat down across from me at lunch and he said, well, Kathleen, how's the Chinese recorder project coming along? And I said, oh, if I'd had any idea how big this was going to be, I doubt if I would have started it. And he looked at me and said what I think should be inscribed on the wall of every scholar. He said, I have never known an academic project to contract. They always <laughs> expand. This is very true. And of course, yeah, that's very true. And of course, this was year one of nine, you know, and I didn't know how long it would be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these were the days when book salesmen used to come and visit people at universities. And I took special joy in saying to them, they would say, oh, I'll wait till you're finished. And I would turn and look at them very carefully. And I would say, it's going to be several years. Are you willing to wait that long? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. so let me, let me, th all these, these um, recollections are so amazing to me and to, I think to everyone who will watch this, but this inspires me to move on to the next question. And that is, of course, the Chinese recorder is only one project that you've done. It's certainly yeah. mental, but you've done other projects. And we've been asking all of the scholars, was there ever a moment during your research where you discovered something that changed how you th think about the field of China Christianity studies? I don't think it changed the way I thought about it, but my greatest, greatest find was I was at, um, uh, 
oh my goodness, this is not a good day for me. I can't surface any of these things. Princeton Theological Seminary Archives. Mm -hmm. And I had perceived that there was stuff there from reading things in the Yale archives. So I went to Princeton and I looked up China and I went down among the archives and I looked and there were 70, 70 boxes of stuff labeled to China. Hmm. And I thought, oh no, not another 70 boxes. It's gonna take another decade. So I simply pulled one out and I took it to a table and I opened it up and there was a letter thrown on the top. It wasn't in any files. And it was addressed to the Reverend Donahue, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I opened it up and I started reading. And uh, my puppy's exploring things. Uh, it was beautiful handwriting, absolutely beautiful penmanship. Absolutely correct English, not a word misspelled, nothing misused. And as I read, it was quite a long letter. And as I read, it became obvious that this had been written by a Chinese because much of it was about the Exclusion Act. And the writer was saying that uh, they would take the case all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. And I thought, who wrote this? You know, and I could later had to say, yeah, I was a little bit thick in the head at that moment. Although I have to admit, only one other person that I've ever read it to correctly guessed who wrote it. I looked at the last page and it was signed, Yong Wing. <laughs> and, you know, this is somebody in a history book, not somebody whose letter I'm sitting there reading. And so I got up and I had met the archivist and his assistant and they were around somewhere. And I went to see him. They said I could have a copy of anything I wanted. So I said, well, I need a copy of this letter. And I said, do you have a vault? And they said, yes, why? I said, I know a number of people at Yale who would kill for this letter. <laughs> neither, one of them, neither one of them had any idea who it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I told them who it was. <laughs> I said, lock up the letter, please. <laughs> Don't leave it sitting in a box. But can you imagine 70 boxes and I picked the one yeah. that has a letter from Young Wing in it. So I think that was my greatest moment of doing any research. Although once when I was at the Presbyterian archives, um, I, I had minded the store while everybody went to their Christmas party. But the UPS man would come and he wouldn't leave things if the door wasn't answered. So I said, ah, I'm working on this. That's, that's fine. I'll sit here. So the director said, okay, I'm going to give you a special tour. And he took me into their vault. And I was well aware that there were some valuable paintings hanging around on the walls. But we went into the vault and he handed me a few things. And I looked at one and I unwrapped it. And I said, oh, that's absolutely beautiful. And he said, Oh, I'm glad you like it. Paul Revere made it. <laughs> it was communion wear. <laughs> or, or there was a lot of altar wear, too. And he said, oh, we got a lot of Paul Revere pieces. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, <laughs> this is an interesting day in my life. <laughs> well, you know, so there, I, yeah. Archives, arch, archives today, it's, these are experiences that are very rare today. More and more scholars are kept in reading rooms and have very, uh, un, very limited access. You've had wonderful access to-, to, to Oh documents. yeah, oh yeah, I know I did. And you can see these things, you know, if you have a reason and you know they're there. Um, but 
even the letters he had told me at that time all the letters they had from martin luther king jr were locked in the vault and there were copies in the files yeah right. yeah well so if you want to see but here was young wing just sitting on the top of the box so that, that really is incredible well you know yeah <laughs> before before we press the record button you and i were talking privately about uh, some travels that you've had in china um, and you mentioned Dunhuang, a place that I very much have enjoyed visiting myself. But yeah. um, I guess one of the questions that we've asked every scholar is if you could recall perhaps one particular moment you've had while in China that, that, uh, uh, that, was, that was particularly meaningful, perhaps while you were conducting your research. Well, at one time, um, I sort of can't remember what happened on which trip to China. You know, after you've been there a while, you, you, <laughs> they melt together. But on one journey in Hainan, I was taken to a partially built building where the church was having, uh, the, holding their services. And when I first went to Hainan, I uh, went to a hotel. I arrived on a Sunday. I went to, hot to the hotel and checked in and said, this is Sunday, I need to go to church. And of course, if you use the word for Protestant church, you're sure to wind up at the Presbyterian church. It was the only group of Protestants there. And I met a woman who had been identified to me when I was in Hong Kong as leader of the underground church in Hainan. And I thought, hmm, she's in the Three Self Church. She introduced herself. And uh, as the morning progressed, uh, they got out some blueprints for the new church the government was helping them build. And I had noticed that in the church service, there were maybe 20 or 25 children attending. And when they showed me the blueprints, uh, they were showing me where the various Sunday school classes were for the children. And, you know, I was by then savvy enough about things Chinese to keep my mouth shut. And I did. And uh, since I've learned that a lot of other churches have built buildings with uh, Sunday school rooms for the children, and it's really none of my business why this the why there were Sunday school rooms for children. If they wanted to build them, fine. Uh, it's like the first time I went to China on a guided tour and one of the men on the tour wanted to take a suitcase full of Bibles to hand out. And uh, I said I didn't think that was a very good idea. Uh, they, and indeed, he decided to leave most of them in the States. But he took some, and when he would pull them out for the Chinese, they would say, oh, thank you, the government prints all we need. And they wouldn't touch them. So <laughs> I figured, you know, there's some, some things that you just shouldn't ask. Yeah. And uh, I think that was one of the, one of the moments when I realized uh, we know very little Mm -hmm. about what's going on and it really isn't our business if chinese have figured out how they understand christianity so be it right you know right. i was i was in moscow oh some years ago now for a mission meeting uh i have to be the only american there uh and i went in the orthodox church that's close to red square and of course i couldn't understand a word of what was going on but i could see what was going on and i thought well i've never seen this kind of christianity before but this is how they understand it mm -hmm. that's it right 
<laughs> I did run into uh, an unfortunate experience with someone who really they want, they hired me to write a book mm -hmm. about their organization in China. And they had in the 1970s devised a statement of faith, which they sent to the Chinese church and asked them to sign it. And of course it was never signed. Mm -hmm. And it was a Chinese person who finally said to them, look, they're not going to sign this. And when I saw this, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I mean, uh, a communist revolution had taken place, the cultural revolution had happened, and foreigners thought they were going to dictate to the Chinese what a statement of faith was. Whew. Yeah, yeah. We don't learn. Right, right. We, we don't learn. Professor. And, oh, and the, the hilarious part of uh, that research project was I learned that missionaries are just people, and so are Chinese Christians. Because the scandal, and there were many scandals in these records, including one Protestant church uh, skimming money from another Protestant church, uh, when they uh, said they'd give them 3% and the stock market was running at about 18%. Uh, they were skimming the 15% off for the, anyway. Oh, goodness. The real scandal was they sent the librarian to the University of Illinois to get a library degree. And then several people there were graduates of University of Illinois, and they got their alumni magazine and saw pictures of his wedding to a young Chinese Christian woman. Uh, of course, he had a wife and nine children who were employed by the mission back in China, and they did what I thought was the most unchristian thing I could think of. They threw his first wife and the nine children out of the mission. And I and wrote him and said, we're not supporting your family anymore. And I thought about that and I said, but they were blameless. Right. They didn't do anything. He is the one that did something. But it happened. But, oh, dear, they didn't want anybody to know about that. Right. And on and on. I mean, there was embezzlement involved. Uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. It, it left me... Uh, kind of shaken. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Prof uh, Professor, Ludwig, Professor Ludwig, speaking of people, um, and, and, and uh, first off, all of us who have conducted scholarship it, and we read archives, we discover these interesting stories, and many of which, some of which can be scandalous at times. But speaking of people, we've asked every scholar to actually talk about another scholar in our field. And I wonder if you might have any pleasant memory about another scholar in our field uh, that you think should be remembered among those of us who do research in this area. Yeah, before I answer that, I want to say that one time I was at the University of Nanjing and they asked me to talk about missionaries. And when it was over, one of Timor's closest friends said, I never thought of being a missionary as a job. Because I had said, well, it was a job, and it was a very good job in the 1930s. You got paid. And, you know, that was a big revelation to him was, you know, well, this is a job. And it's one you're probably going to get if you're in good health and you're not too far out crazy. <laughs> Some of them were. <laughs> Indeed. The, it, to Hainan, the Presbyterian sent a woman uh, whose medical doctor had said too late to stop her from taking ship. Uh, she's in poor health. She will never, ever survive in the tropics. Uh, she died at 103 in California. So much for 
<laughs> for, for that one. Now, other, other scholars in the field, other than Gilmore, of course, <laughs> um, I think I like, I like Shilian's work on the conversion of missionaries. And he worked on uh, Frank Rawlinson, among others. In fact, that's how I met John Rawlinson. I met Shilian at a, uh, I think, a history meeting. And I got up to ask a question and, you know, said my name. And he came scurrying up when the session was over. And he said he was going to see John Rawlinson. And I said, oh, I've never met him. Can I tag along? Because I used to call him and say things like, is it Wong Wu or Wu Wong? And he would say whatever it was. <laughs> I'd say, thanks, goodbye, and off we go. <laughs> and he got so accustomed to hearing these strange telephone calls, you know. But I like uh, what Chilean has done because he's very, very um, knowledgeable about both cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that to have a Chinese well steeped in American culture, like Yung Ling, <laughs> but then to look at the Chinese church, or in, in his first book, to, in his first work or book, to look at the missionaries. And this is something very, very few people have yet to work on, is how did being a missionary change the missionaries? Mm -hmm. Someone of, at Yale Press a few years ago wanted me to uh, write a book on people who were born in China and how they succeeded in the US. Well, it turned out that there just weren't enough of these people because if those that were, they tended to come back to the States for education and so missed their teenage years in China. But I think she has a good handle on how China could have changed people, and they might not even have realized it. Mm -hmm. You know, things that begin to look normal to you. It's like if you ride a bicycle. If you're accustomed to going everywhere on a bicycle, when someone says, oh, here's my car, you can borrow it for the day, uh, it's very different. Although you know how to drive a car, there's no problem with driving the car, but usually you get around on a bicycle. And I think, um, I think one of the things that most changed the missionaries was the food. Hmm. You know, even Hudson Taylor couldn't control what people ate. He could control where they lived or what they said, but not what they ate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like um, the book Curry uh, about foreigners in India and what they ate. <laughs> when the missionaries got home, they longed for Chinese food. And they probably didn't really understand that. And why it was that they wanted to eat Chinese food at home. They had been doing it in China and they didn't realize that it had become part of their culture. Right. So I think she has got a real handle on that. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how things can change so subtly that the individual might not even realize the change is taking place, but it's there. Right. You know, interestingly, so many of us who study China, when Xi Lian talks about the conversion of missionaries, even scholars become sort of converted to a love of China. 
at least I have, you know, um, uh, one of the things I personally love to do is cook my own Chinese food. So I, I completely understand that. Well, Professor Ludwig, there's one last question, but other scholars want me to ask you in particular an additional question. And the, the Can I make one more observation about the change? Yes. Many years ago, I read that someone said the difference between Russia specialists and Chinese specialists in the United States is Russian studies came from the Russian Revolution in 1917. And the people who became the professors tended to be white Russians. And they had a particular view of communism. Whereas China scholars tended to be returned missionaries. And they had a very, what shall I say, kind, benevolent, uh, even paternalistic view of China. So all of their students grew up academically loving China. And I, I looked then afterwards to see if that, I thought that was true, and I think it is. Because, you know, my dinner is going to be Chinese tonight. My, my family, when my parents were alive and lived with me, they just knew, uh, you know, a certain number of days things Chinese would turn up. I once had a repairman walk into my house. I had some scrolls of characters and some Chinese paintings on the wall. And it was one of the few times in my life I've ever seen anyone do a double take. He did. But I wanted to make that observation about the difference between and why. It's, I've met one person in my life who said he didn't think he would ever go again to China, and that was Ernst Wolf. Did I tell you about him and about the recording he did? Yes. Yeah. No. And, Wait. you know, who, who on earth studies German Jews who are living in China right. in the 1930s? I mean, there yeah. must have been others than him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What's your last question? So, well, two more questions. But the second okay. last question is this. When people talk about the, the, the beginning of our field, China Christianity studies, they often mention two people. One person is Dan Bays, who, of course, had this project uh, uh, that was funded by the Henry Luce Foundation, and that really helped congeal scholars. Yep. The other person everyone mentions is Kathleen Lodwick, because, oh. because the AAS, of course, never had a scholarly group who specialized in the study of China Christianity. And you were instrumental in bringing together what was then called the China Missions Group. Mm -hmm. so just if you, if you could briefly tell us how that came to be, how did you make that happen? <laughs> I think I asked somebody at the annual meeting how you became an affiliated society. I think I asked one of the officers. Um, and they told me, and I think I mentioned to you once before, at that time they had a Gilbert and Sullivan aficionados group that met yearly at AAS. And I figured China missions had more to do with China than Gilbert and Sullivan did. Japan, maybe not, but that's another story. And I have noticed that there are two very big topics that AAS would not touch. One of them was missionaries. And all the years I had been going there, I had never seen a panel on missionaries in China. And the other one, and until I retired and stopped going to meetings, I don't think there ever was a panel on Eurasians. Mm. Those are the two absolute taboos at AAS, missionaries and Eurasians. And wasn't it Queen Victoria who got mad at Bolivia once and erased it from the, from the map? I think it was her. 
Well, you know, if you ignore the fact, you never have a panel about missionaries in China, that doesn't mean they weren't there. That doesn't mean they didn't have some impact on the society and on the home societies. Just because you wish to ignore them intellectually doesn't mean they didn't exist. And I learned how incredibly hurt so many scholars are apparently by the Christianity of their childhood from the things they have said, I have heard said to me over the years. Who missionaries? Well, you know, when you start saying, well, you know, they did introduce Western science and Western ideas of government. And, you know, you can argue good or bad. It happened. And trying to ignore it doesn't make it go away. And when I asked, the, you'd asked me once uh, about the name, the China Mission Group, because uh, how many times have I been asked, are there missionaries in China today? And I say, no, it's illegal for them to be there. How many do you want me to name that I personally know? And, you know, people look at me like, huh? Uh, well, uh, I have met a number of people who went as English teachers who admit to using Bible stories as lessons in English. And, I mean, the Chinese aren't so naive as to think this wasn't going to happen. In fact, I asked the uh, ambassador to uh, the U.S. once. He was in the Allentown area, gave a talk. I asked him what would be the impact of the returned students, since in the past, the returned students uh, changed China a lot. And he kind of talked around the answer to that question. But again, as the missionaries long for the Chinese food at home, uh, I'm sure that uh, when the Chinese, when the returned students got home, they longed for whatever it was they were missing at the moment. Now, did yeah. John Fairbank, the rumor is that John Fairbank and Paul Cohen and Jonathan Spence, that some of these people really supported the idea of having a scholarly group that studied missionaries in China. Were they part of this process? In the early years. No, they, they were very much in favor of the group, uh, and so was Fred Wakeman. Hmm. At one time, I asked him to write me a letter uh, of support when I was working with this uh, corrupt organization, and I said, look, history isn't what happened. It's what got remembered about what happened, written down and left in a place a historian could find it. And he's in California, right? I'm in Pennsylvania. You could have heard him without the phone. Amen, amen to that brother. Well, you know, this is what happened. And he, when I told him we had this group that we started, I said, a lot of the scholars are being encouraged to look at missionaries, the ones in China. He said, oh, I didn't know that. That explains why I get all these letters. People wanting to do research on mission, Chinese, wanting to do research on missionaries, but with me in California. I said, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, they, they're smart enough. And if they were harmed by their religious upbringings, they didn't allow it to intervene in their scholarly life, uh, as so many other people I've met had. And, you know, they, they didn't want to be Queen Victoria and erase the missionaries from the map of China. Hey, folks, they were there. Uh, they had to have some impact even by being there. So I think it's legitimate to look at them and 
say what happened. It's the largest movement of humans for a nonviolent, we hope, uh, endeavor that nobody asked for, but it just descended upon the Chinese. Well, goodness, <laughs> you have to expect some kind of outcome. And if what has appeared in China today as the Christian church, then so be it. Uh, I think everyone interprets Christianity in the way they understand it. You know, I didn't know that Russian Orthodox people think Jesus was born in a cave. And uh, I mean, why would I know that? I'm, I'm a secular historian, right? And I thought, well, what difference does it make? And indeed, that is the question, what difference does it make? And the answer is none. So uh, what else is new? And you'd asked me in one of the emails about why I'm so uh, much in favor of um, people studying Catholic missionaries as well as Protestant. Because if you read very long in the Protestant archives, you'll come across information about Catholic missionaries. And in the Chinese recorder, it's Protestant, it says it's Protestant, but there are tons of articles about Catholic missionaries, as indeed there are about missionaries in India and Africa and even to the American Indians. The other thing is, well, there's a little book published by Margaret Moninger called Isle of Palms, and it's about the Presbyterian mission on Hainan Island, of which she's a member. And the last few pages are the translation of the Jesuit tombstones at the Jesuit cemetery in Haiko, which she was a whiz at Latin. And uh, they seem to have died all about the same time, but it doesn't look like a plague because they had gravestones. They were all buried and they had engraved gravestones. And I doubt if you would find another place in any publication where those tombstones are even mentioned. Right. And the Japanese built the airport over the foreign cemetery in the early 40s, late 30s. So they're no longer there. And I said this, Rob Carboneau had organized a, a little conference once for lay people. And I said, well, you better be open-minded because if you want to know about the Jesuits in the 1600s in Hainan, you're going to have to read this book about the Presbyterian mission. And everybody kind of oh, hadn't thought of that, had they? And Gilmore was very interested in the uh, CICM missionaries out in the Ordos region. How were they making so many converts? He was making none. Well, they were doing desert agriculture and renting out pieces of land and things that the Protestants were never allowed to do. And they got some converts. So you're going to have to be a pretty open-minded about this and also to look at the council records because there was a council in uh, Haiko and at one time uh, he made a list of all the foreign missionaries. He's British. There was never an American representative there. He's British, but he makes a list of every missionary on the island. And most of them are Americans, a few were Canadians, one Swiss, you know, a few assorted other people. But it's there in the counselor records. Well, guess what? There was a strange woman who appeared in an awful lot of photographs of a certain year. And I had no idea who that woman was until I read the counselor records. And she was identified as a globetrotter spending a year with the Presbyterian missionaries. 
putting her hand to what needed to be done. So, you know, keep looking and you'll find some really funny, funny places to learn about missionaries. This is good advice to sort of look at all the records and look at all the denominations. Well, you, I, I'm looking at our time and I, I think I should ask you the last question. And this is a question we've asked all the scholars and, and, uh, some scholars have said, well, this is the most difficult question, and some have had a lot to say, but that is, especially the junior scholars are interested in hearing what more published scholars have to say about this, and that is, Professor Lodwick, what are your hopes for the future of this field? My thoughts for the future of this field? Um, well, as long as people don't go back to thinking, uh, that's uh, not something we're studying. And as long as the Christianity in China group at the AAS isn't taken over by uh, people who are sure they need to convert the whole of China to Christianity tomorrow. Um, when we, you asked earlier what the, how, how we got that group. And after it was approved, one of the officers of the organization said, well, we did discuss whether or not your purpose was to convert the Chinese to Christianity. And it was all I could do to bite my tongue and say, did you ask the same about the communist studies group? But I was polite and I didn't ask that. But I think that there will be an expanded interest in this field as the world grows smaller. You know, it's, it's like once you've tasted uh, dim sum, you want to go on eating dim sum the rest of your life. Well, you know, many Chinese who are not Christian, like the fellow who wrote uh, uh, Colors of the Sounds of the River, Colors of the Mountain, where did he learn English? from a Christian in his village. And when the missionary was thrown out of Beijing by the government because of what he was doing, the Chinese fellow asked for the Bible. He doesn't tell us if it's in English or Chinese. I suspect it's in English because he says it has Jesus's words in red in it. And he took it home to her. And she was so overjoyed because she'd lost her own Bible to the cultural revolutionaries. So I think, you know, you can't undo what has happened. You know, I lived in Taiwan for a while. I cannot ever undo that in my life. Did it change me? Yes. My own mother told me that after I came home, she and I were doing something at the kitchen sink, and I said to her, turn off the water, you're wasting it. Which she said I would never have said before I lived in Asia. So how did it influence me? I didn't know I had said such a thing, but obviously it had an impact on me. If the, I think the field will expand now that people have begun to look at it, and they're not afraid to um, uh, mention that there were some people who really were out of it, not just eccentric, but okay, I'll say it, crazy in the missions. And, you know, this was hidden. Alvin Austin uh, mentions how many suicides there were in the CIM. Hudson Taylor, if you'd asked him, he would have said there were none. But it happens. These are people. And as long as we're interested in people, I think people will study those who go and live in another country. You know, when uh, Paul... Uh, Paul is at Khan, was writing the biography of Pearl Buck. I said, is, he's in literature. 
I said, is she the only American writer who ever spent her entire formative years in another country? And he couldn't think of anyone else. Neither could I. Well, I mean, you clearly see how that changed her life in what she wrote about. And so I think these things will interest people. And there are people like Gilmore who went there all this time and thought they were a failure. And 150 years later, there are people in four countries that I know of who are still examining his book. So do they have an impact? Yes. Yes. Professor Ludwig, uh, what a rich, what a, a rich interview. And uh, we're just now approaching the end of our time, but I want to say uh, what scholars seldom have a chance to say, and that is, uh, I just want to personally thank you for your contribution to this field, for your publications, for your work, for your dedication, for your um, ability to persuade the AAS to allow scholars who are interested in this field to be in a way legitimized by this scholarly interest. And, um, and I want to tell you that your work has been near my desk for decades. So, oh my. so personally, I just want to say thank you. And, um, and, uh, and I know that a lot of other scholars also feel indebted to your contribution. So, so and, and again, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. What an honor it was. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I, I once went to Penn State's uh, uh, paternal library and I went to microfilms and I asked, I got out the Chinese recorder index and I took it over to the counter and I said to the fellow, does anybody use this? He said, oh, they use it all the time. You know why? Because they know they're going to find something there. And I said, oh, I said, uh, you don't know me, but I teach at Penn State too. And I'm Kathleen Lodwick. He almost fainted. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I just wanted to know if people if found it useful. And he said, yes. So, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think you're doing a wonderful job of keeping this going. You know, one of the reasons it sort of collapsed when I retired was that um, there was big changes in the permanent staff of AAS. And for a while, we weren't even getting requests to reserve a room. So, well, things are so lots of reasons. Right. Well, thank you so much. Uh -huh.